I'll introduce the hour here briefly and uh, hand it over to Colleen, but thank you all for joining us. We've been running an online film festival this week, so the film that Colleen is featured in, which is called Pilgrims and Tourists, is running for free online. Hope all of you have had a chance to watch it. And we thought that it would be great at the end of each film, because there's four films in the Standing on Sacred Ground series, we thought it would be great to have somebody from the film speak and update viewers and listeners and fans uh, as to what's going on, because uh, the films were made a few years ago and there's never an end to the updates and, and uh, need, to, need to follow up. And Colleen has been uh, fighting, as those of you who had a chance to watch the film, she has been fighting Shasta Dam, uh, since her ancestors were flooded out by that dam many years ago in the 40s, lost burials, villages, sacred sites, ceremonial grounds. And 40 years after uh, Grams, who was Colleen's predecessor as the leader of the Winnemum, uh, started really having to fight the government's plans to raise the dam, Colleen continues fighting. So I thought, Colleen, maybe we could start with uh, the question of, can you update folks as to what's going on? Uh, Trump wants to raise the dam. Westlands Water District has David Bernhard in there, former lobbyist as Secretary of Interior. So what's going on with the fight against Shasta Dam and, and uh, tell folks what they can do over time to support your struggle? Yeah, for now it's um, going full steam ahead. You know, it doesn't matter that the COVID isn't interfering in a lot of our ability to react, but um, the Bureau of Reclamation is continuing on as well as uh, getting money from the government. I mean, that's underway. Uh, some of the exceptions that are being made for endangered species right now will also affect the Shasta Dam endangered species list <clears throat> as far as what the government is, has in mind for the water system in California. Um, and even though people have said over the decades, <laughs> don't worry about it, it's never going to get raised. And we have been on uh, alert the whole time because we have been the people who suffered from the mind boggling. Uh, plans that somebody conjured up somewhere to get themselves rich. And this is that same kind of plan. It's going to make a lot of people rich. It's going to make a lot of people uh, in power over water in California. And even though a lot of people don't recognize that, uh, water is going to become very expensive because of what's happening right now. And even though we're fighting for our sacred places and bringing the salmon back, the forward thinking is that our river runs all the way to the ocean and whatever happens to the water system all the way to the ocean happens to all of us and right now the water is being owned it's, it's, she lost her shoe let's try to get it sorry granddaughter going to the garden <laughs> food sovereignty is underway <laughs> as we're trying to save the water <laughs> But uh, we, have, we have been in conversations with the Bureau of Reclamation for decades. <clears throat> and now they're, they're acting like they don't know who we are. They're pushing ahead for a clearance uh, to go ahead and do Shasta, get the regulations in place, and they will uh, mitigate later if there is a problem. And so we're in this uh, precarious place with the state of California opposing any studies or any uh, state um, participation with this raise of Shasta Dam, which also means that the State Historic Preservation Office uh, will not assist us because they cannot be a part of the Shasta Dam raise. And so we have to reach out again to the federal government, which I'm not really, uh, you know, I'm not really comfortable with, but with ACHP, the 
counterpart in the federal government to make a study for the Shasta Dam and make a statement, even though BOR doesn't really have to, uh, you know, follow any of what they say, even SHPO, but they also have to have something on the cultural issues that are at stake. And right now what they're saying is, um, we recognize that there is an issue, but we're gonna deal with those issues later. You know, after they build a dam, probably. <laughs> yeah, it's an so. incredible catch-22 irony that they're yeah. ahead, allocating a little bit of money when it's not <laughs> a legal project, the environmental impact study, the cultural study hasn't been completed. And it's all tied into Newsom's tunnel plan to ship more water, as you teach us all, ship more water to the south, build maybe sites reservoir on the Sacramento, which would have no water unless they raise Shasta Dam. So they're trying to create this momentum. And um, anyway, thank you for fighting against it for, for decades and in the name of salmon and you know, people and the, even the economy, because it's, it's gonna be a waste of a billion dollars if they actually do it. You right. know, you, you mentioned um, COVID-19. I think everybody's dealing with it, afraid of it praying for you know, those who are ill, supporting the people on the front lines who are dealing with healthcare. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you see this virus in terms of earth changes and what the message is and what the opportunity is going forward? What's your vision for how this might lead to a different path forward? Yeah, you know, I have mixed feelings about the COVID. On the one hand, uh, I can relate to Graham's talking about the various uh, diseases that hit our tribe up the river and we had no protections and no way of knowing what it was and only trying to use what we um, had available without any doctors and uh, without knowledge of where that where that might have come and what might it might help cure it and so I, I think about those and cause she would say We'd go up the river and she'd, she'd go up, walk up the river with her mom, Jenny, and she'd be visiting family in different villages. And then she'd say they go back up there the next week and half of them would have died. Mm. You know, it was that kind of a, a time. And I see that, that this has that uh, same capacity to do to people and is doing to a lot of people. And maybe it's not as big as it could um be with the protections and preventions that governors are taking but i also see that you know we have been praying and praying and praying for change for something good to happen while this is uh really paralyzed the government <coughs> hey 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 out I've got some back. cool sunglasses there. <laughs> yeah. Go down to the garden. Oh. Go, go, go. <laughs> that, uh, um, you know, I saw a picture of LA and they could see the horizon. Mm. You know, the, the smog had, has lifted and some waters are, are actually getting cleaner. Mm. And, you know, the, there are a lot of good things in nature, like you see the uh, lions in Africa, <laughs> they're laying, you know, they're just laying at where they can be in the zoos. They were talking about the animals are, are, uh, are, um, ha are getting pregnant now because not everybody's right there watching them. I mean, they have a little bit of time to themselves yeah you know and that's what we talk about on the mountain all the time is for boy and puyuk is like there has to be a time when nobody goes here that these spirit beings have to have time of their own and all of the the birds that used to be in the meadow aren't in the meadow because too many people and mm -hmm. the deer that used to come in the meadow you know they're not there because you have people hiking everywhere all over the place you know and maybe they still are because that's not um a crowded situation like a department store 
or busy highway kind of thing. But nature needs to have a break. And if the good part about this pandemic is that nature gets to recover, then we have a, a prayer being answered on one hand. But on the other hand, it's like the people have to learn how to do this without a pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in, in the film In the Light of Reverence, where we met back in the 90s, right. it's one of the, to me, it's one of the most powerful thoughts. The Vine Deloria says, you know, that these sacred places need time of their own. And then people who know how to minister to them can go and do what's necessary on a spiritual level, which environmentalists seem to be catching up to that idea, but they're still, you know, really not there. For environmentalists, it's often such a physical concern, water pollution, air pollution, extinction of species. But um, I just, I'm so honored to be able to try to understand your, you know, the spiritual dimension of your ecological view and how, um, you know, it's so great to think of Panther Meadows with nobody there except waiting for the Winnemum to come in August to sing, and then maybe that would be it. Yeah, 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 that's what, that's what, um, I don't know, the people now are locked into maybe the beauty of a place, like whatever, whatever it makes them feel like, instead of being related to the place. And I, and I don't know how to interpret that for them, um, to say that for, for thousands of years, my people, the Winnemum, all of the people before me have had this continuous relationship, this continuous talking to, singing to this place that is uh, a part of our life. It's not something we've just discovered. It's something that we have this ongoing relationship. And other people will pop in for maybe part of their life, maybe five years of their life. But there, it's not a true connection for the place. You know, it's like Winnemum language, the vibrations of that language uh, goes through all of those flowers in the meadow. It goes through all of the bees that are buzzing and it fits. Other language have places like that, but that is not one of them. <clears throat> if they don't speak minimum, if they don't, if they're not from the people who um, pretty much administer to that place by being there. I mean, one of the issues that I have is like you saw my granddaughter, she's three years old and she can't go there for maybe another 12 years. Mm -hmm because that's such a spiritual place in our belief system that that's the way it works. It isn't that we don't want her to see the beautiful flowers and, and we don't think it's gonna be uh, an experience that you know she needs right now because of the place, but recognizing a power of a place and the purpose of that place is not for children. You know, and, and that's a hard concept for a lot of people to, to get, you know, about these places. They don't have those restrictions. They can go anywhere and they can take anybody with them and, and they have all, every right to do so. It's public, you know, it's a public access. You know, expanding that um, to, the, to the planet, one of the things that Graham's, uh, and when we mention Graham's for everybody who's listening, it's, it's Florence Jones who was the medicine woman, top doctor of the Winnemum, who was the leader of the tribe before Colleen. She trained and selected Colleen to be the leader. But one of the things that Grams said to me back then, and, and we've talked about a lot, is that there are 20 sacred mountains that hold the world together. And in many ways, the Standing on Sacred Ground film series was sort of my attempt to go off and try to see if I could 
find some of those 20 sacred mountains and come back and report to you because your question was, are people doing their jobs out there? You know, because back in the 90s, there was no free communication via the internet and the planet was just bigger and, and more expensive and travel was harder. And so, um, you know, we found Uchin Mech in uh, Altai and Mount Achaea. You guys have been back and forth and talk about how the volcanoes are linked. Could you talk a little bit about your, the, the, the belief or the vision that there are 20 sacred mountains around the world that, that hold the world together and that it's important that the people of those places be doing their jobs as, as the Winnemum are doing at Mount Shasta or William Puyuk? Yeah, you know, uh, when I was much younger <clears throat> and, I, and learning from Grams and listening to her and, you know, t her talking about these places and, you know, and we'd go over to the ocean and, and we have a whale song. And I'm thinking to myself, it's like, we're inland tribe. We're like the mountain tribe. We're like, you know, two hours by car to get to the ocean. Yet we have a whale song. And we have a place where abalone fits into our uh, culture and our, our traditions. And then uh, talking about those sacred mountains, uh, I realized that even though we have this watershed, we're from this watershed for thousands of years. Our job is to take care of this mountain and this watershed. Yet we have that knowledge of a complete world, of this place that helps our mountain. And our mountain is one of the oldest mountains in the world. And that knowledge that comes from that place that we go and uh, we sing to that water that comes out from inside this great mountain, realizing that when we sing to that water, it passes us by as we're singing, it's going down the stream. And when it leaves us, we know that we're not gonna get home in time to benefit from all of that singing that that water left with. But realizing that when we're singing to that water, that song is going to the whales mm. and we're connected in that way. And that the water that comes out of the ground is pushed up from inside the mountain. And the water on Mauna Kea at Lake Wyal, that water comes from inside the mountain. And so in Uchmek, the two lakes on that mountain come from inside the mountain, more so than any kind of runoff or a stream leading into them. It's like these are the connections of some of the oldest water in the world that are connected by this web of lava tubes inside. And so Graham's always says that, you know, that water chooses where it will come up. If you put down your traditions and stop doing what you should do, water will change. Maybe it won't come there no more because you're not singing to it. And so for us, um, you know, as soon as our children are old enough to be there, we have to have plan for them to have the belief enough to continue when they're old enough because it's the first time they've ever been there to continue to go there and sing. That's a struggle in this day and age, right? Mm -hmm. And I benefited from having grams, you know, in my life, my whole life. I wasn't one who went off and did something and then came back and found her. You know, my mom and dad are from, from the river and all my relatives are from the river. And we continued that connection, even though Shasta Dam was put in that our visits to the river, like Graham says, you know, they might have taken our homes off of the river, but they haven't taken our home out of the river. And so we're still connected that way. And those 20 sacred mountains, when we ask that question is that because we didn't have all these things and we didn't know people in other, I mean, um, other countries, other states even, uh, to figure out is like 
I'm hoping that we're not the only ones still singing to the waters. You know, that we have uh, benefited from that for our own people. But to hold Mother Earth together, we have to have this big global look at what the other mountains are doing. And that's kind of what we wanted to know at the time is that are there still people who believe in their own traditional way of life, aside from churches, aside from other religions, but their own indigenous religious way? Does that still exist? And so that was the, that was the ask, uh, but also to kind of identify these other mountains. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So that, I have one more question, and then if people want to write some questions in the Q&A window, which you can click on at the bottom of your screen uh, and send some questions. Um, the, the, the last question I had, Colleen, was um, what have you, what's been the value of this sort of um, interconnectedness now with other leaders in other parts of the world? So we have Sacred Site Guardians, we've gone to some conferences in South Korea and in Hawaii and um, you go to the Paris climate meeting and what is the value of sacred site guardians getting together and meeting and sharing information? What, what has that meant for you? What has that change brought about in your thinking and, and has, has it been valuable? Yeah, I think the, the most important thing is like when I was growing up, Grams had all these connections up and down the state, Indian doctors, leaders, up and down the state. And whenever she would ask for a prayer to be done for maybe staving off an earthquake or something was coming, and they would come together in a moment and make that prayer. And as time passed and all of those uh, people left in some way or another, um, I was looking for who took their place, hmm. who's carrying on those things. Because uh, in my tribe, we have a um, traditional transition of those powers to the next person, even though we know who they are. For the longest time, we know who they are. But the spirit beings have to also accept them. So there's a transition time where you go to all these sacred places. And the sacred places agree that you're the one that they'll communicate with after the one that they had before is no longer able to. And so when, when we opened it up like that and I was able to see other people, even though they're struggling, they're just like us, you know, they don't have, they're not the fortunate people who have all the money, all the power, any champions in their government, you know, they're, they're like us. They don't have any of that. But they have their sacredness. They have their sacred powers. And I think that when we connect those together, uh, we become stronger. It's kind of like mountain to mountain is the strength that we uh, proceed with. And as long as we can um, keep that in view, and keep the conversations going, we're adding more people to it all the time. Like now I'm part of the um, Global Caucus for Indigenous Women. And with, um, with Themi and uh, the other South American leaders. And I see a difference in some ways is that um, a lot of people have gotten caught up into other religions and other ways of leadership besides traditional but among them there are those traditional ways and i look for that because i think that before all of the isms like racism socialism fascism capitalism all of those things there was a way of life uh, that included everything and everybody without an ism it's like it's just a fact and as we come through this this world changing time, like my like Graham said, things are going to change that um, 
bad times are going to come because of the way that people treat the water. And because, and people all over the world treat the water badly. There's only a few people who uh, recognize that water is a, is a spirit being and has a part of nature that has rights and is uh, the only purpose that we're alive is because nature allows us to, be, to live. Hmm. It isn't the government that allows us to live, it's nature. You know, and so when we look around at the ability to bring in, you know, Daniil and Pua and Winona LaDuke and uh, Chan Roy and all, all of the people who are connected in that goodness, uh, we combine our strength or we combine that vibration that tells Mother Nature there are still humans here that are trying to do the good thing, that are trying to bring their people up in the good way. You know, and I think that's important in a time when uh, the COVID is, like Graham says, there'll be a number of them. So I'm looking at this as the first one. Mm. And we should learn from this. We should, we should uh, try, to, try to make some good changes because we have uh, places that have clean air that never had clean air before. So can we learn from that and not make that air all dirty again? I don't know. So. <laughs> Seems so simple and obvious, not simple, but just so <laughs> logical, you know? Absolutely. Um, Jessica asked, uh, when you were describing Grams and Jenny walking up the river and how the Winnemum had been hit by previous pathogens with no resistance, was that, during the 1918, was that the Spanish flu time when maybe that happened? Yeah, that was. Um, <coughs> Jenny, Jenny was the top doctor then on the river, and Grams was a little girl learning. You know, she had, she had already started her. Well, they pretty much know from birth that they're going to be on that, that way to healing to be in the healer. And so that's why she accompanied her mom going up and down the river. Um, in fact, they walked clear over to Potem Creek where my mom was born to assist in her birth. So, uh, but not only that, but other diseases at the time, it was like waves of diseases that came up the river from uh, the influenza to you know, the, the, the Spanish flu, but also other diseases that were brought in, like smallpox and, uh, you know, disease used as warfare to reduce the populations at the time, you know. Yeah. Because we were, you know, at that time being shot, <laughs> shot on site for money. So that's a pandemic that nobody else went through, you know, uh, of being, um, legally killed for money that's right yeah sad sad chapter so listen if folks have questions um please ask i we colleen and i had an idea i'm gonna um do something i've this i'm new at this but i'm gonna share my screen and run through a few slides just a few photos while some of you please in the q a chat well let's do here's two questions um I'll, we'll do this first Peter Oppenheimer, one of my old friends, asks, is there a respectful way in which non-Indigenous people can visit Mount Shasta? Hmm. That's what I'm wondering. Is there? Because <laughs> they haven't found it yet. <laughs> I just saw that they're uh, postponing their water ceremony on Mount Shasta because of the pandemic, I guess. This is some new age group? Yes. Yeah. 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 And and a lot of times it's like we're not talking about anything more than a way for somebody to make some money off of other people who are deficient in their views of their own religious rights. And that's the wrong part about it. Yeah. You know, on on one hand, it, it feels to me like people are unwilling to 
correct their own religious way and seek out others other ways it's like for me it's like i don't know i don't think i can just kind of uh, become upset with the winnemum religion and then go seek out maybe maybe i'll take on the lakota language or songs or or you know religious ways or i'll go down to navajo and maybe i'll go you know practice the kiva way because i'm upset with my own winnemum way when I really have to work with why is this happening and how do we fix it, you know, or should it be fixed and we should change. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know if there is a, I think, I think that the most respectful way to visit some places like this is probably to go with the people who have the connection. And that way you'll be doing what you should be doing. You'll be building the fires where you should be building the fires. You'll be sitting where you should be sitting and not in the meadow, not on the grasses, not cutting across, you know, all of these places that you don't know what the rules are. And if you want to abide by indigenous rules, those have been in place for thousands of years to continue to have it look like it looks that makes you feel good about the way that it looks. Indigenous people could have walked across the meadow, could have camped in the meadow, could have had big dances and stomped down all the flowers and, and been within their rights, but they believe that the place is so sacred that we can only go there once every year. We should only go there once because that is reserved for the spirit beings for the things that take care of Mount Shasta, it's such a, such a place like that. But anymore, you know, it's in the books of travel, a place to travel to, you know, something to see. If you haven't seen everything, go there. So it's, it's a different way of thinking about things, but the respect for a place requires you to study what that place is about and the best way to be there. You know, and I don't know if they have books like that. Well, I think what you said about honoring the folks who are the caretakers and have the hundreds and thousands of years of connection and tradition is definitely the place to start. A follow-up question is, what can people who don't come from a long line now of traditional ways that have been passed down do to reorient themselves in a good way of being on the earth? And that would that would be just uh, any person, not particularly a tribal person, or correct. I think yeah, that would be any person. Yeah. Yeah, and you know it's so hard because the the society that we have now is more inclined to look at things in a, a profit. Yeah. A profit look at things. It's like, can I afford to go there? If I go afford to go there, what can I afford to do? And short of doing uh, these other things, you know, it's, it's always about uh, st the stimulation inspires a book to be written, you know, inspires um, to bring more people to this place. Like, yeah. in, like in your film, uh, In Light of Reverence, when the one realtor says, and we can bring 10,000 people to see this. It's like not realizing that if you bring 10,000 people, it is not going to be this pristine forest. Yeah. It's not going to have the herring flying through in the snow. It won't have all that because of your short-sightedness of everybody could be a part of this. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, 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 I see think there you. are places that people uh, can find themselves and sacred places that are named sacred because of a tribal or indigenous peoples, then they have to take that into account. If they just go down on the Sacramento River and there's a quiet little place right there, it wasn't a fishing village, it wasn't, a, you know, anything, and they can say that's sacred to them, right? Mm -hmm. And they can develop a personal relationship with that place. But, uh, so can Maya, 
Maya goes down to the little stream here at the village and she's happy as a little lark about the water. But it's not like a prayer place. It's, it's like a practice place that her and Nechai really are practicing. They're starting to feel like water is something. That, and this is a place that they can play and throw rocks around and get in the water, do that. But that is not going to happen at the Sacred Spring. But other people don't realize that. It's so hard to watch the where you have to put your time and energy to fight off these, these things when, when there are so many, I mean, you're so great at actually teaching the ceremonies to the young people, you know, to keeping the culture alive. But I just, it, it breaks my heart to watch the battles that you, that you really have to fight all the time. There's, there's one person, Julie Bongers, who, who's asking about um, if there's a way that someone could help by sort of studying all the new age groups who are using the mountain, how many are you aware of? Um, she's thinking about graduate students who might, you know, do a study to kind of shed light on this. That might be an answer. That might be a good thing because, <clears throat> you know, we look at the, like the St. Saint, Saint Germain people or the Iamers or the Lemurians and, and they claim to have been there for a long time. But compared to a long time, and a long time uh, to me means generation after generation of my relatives have been there. They're not talking about that. They're not talking about their kids coming back and carrying on their ceremony or their, their way that they wanted to teach is different. Like I expect that my granddaughter who's three is going to be at that spring singing our songs, not some rap song or whatever, <laughs> but she's going to be singing traditional Winnemum songs for the appropriate place, you know, and um, it might be good to study because, you know, we're, we're at loss too about how do you, how do you teach, you know, one, we're working with the forest service, to try to protect the area. And even on in Lake Shasta, we're doing the same thing. It's like, the lake goes down, don't let people be digging up everything. But you have to work with these federal agencies because they're managing this place for the public. At the same time, they can allow the public to actually destroy a place just by overuse, yeah. just by the trails that they put in. And so we work with them trying to divert trails where people can see beautiful parts of the mountain, beautiful waterway that they can sit by the water where it's not gonna be destructive to the sacred place. And convincing them that there doesn't need to be a trail to the headwater. There's no reason for any other group to have to go to the headwater unless we're taking them, unless they're a part of healing that needs to be done. But we only go there, you know, we're not up there every weekend. We're not, we're not doing something every uh, month up there. And we're in an awkward place now because when it is open, we're finding that we have to go up there more often than we should to protect the destruction of the meadow, to protect against all of these ideas that come in about the blood moon, all of these ideas that come in about you know, whatever the new moon, the full moon, you know, somebody's um, dumping cremations in our spring and in, in the meadow itself. And it's like, if somebody could study that, it's like, why do they do that? Why do they bring cremations into a beautiful sacred place, a beautiful place that people say they want to go to and be there? But do you want to be there with ashes? sitting on the rock next to you it's like we don't bury our dead there and and then it comes to my mind it's like how many how many cremations does it take in one place to make a cemetery hmm. you're going to take a you're going to make a public beautiful place 
into a cemetery by dumping all of those ashes. And we try to say, you know, we finally got the Forest Service to post on the sign that it's a crime by public law to dump cremations. Mm -hmm. Yet, even online, there are some places that say, we'll take care of your cremations for $2,500. You can place them in the meadow and, you know, wherever they wanted to be. And so, yeah, maybe a study would help. Maybe people can find out. It's like, and maybe those people are just like, lost i don't know if they're lost or they're crazy or they just don't have anything better to do it's like um a lot of the rainbow family you know they're pretty well off people and they just have time to just hang out and do that until they decide they're going to join the <laughs> populations again we have we have one other question um jane was asking if you could talk a little bit more about the other sacred mountains of the world, the, the relationship, and whether it's the 20 sacred mountains or just say a little more about that, that network. Yeah, you know, I, I have a heart, I have a, I don't know, I've, uh, it's almost like when we name, in the lawsuit, this is what happened in the 1970s. Forest Service wanted to put another ski lodge on the mountain and we opposed it. And in our opposition to that ski lodge going in, we said, that's our, our place. And they came back and said, there's no evidence that you were there. There's no house pits, there's no stone tools, there's nothing. And it's like, there's nothing because it's such a sacred place that we don't even drop anything there. We don't leave anything there. We don't stay there. Yeah. And so we had to divulge that that was a sacred place, that that water was sacred. And once we did that, it became sacred for everybody. It's like everybody's church now. Everybody has to go there. It's like there are a lot of springs on the mountain and they could go to those springs. But for some reason, maybe because we said it was sacred, that it has become the focal of this uh, need to discover your own uh, religious self, you know, or, or good luck place. Like in your movie, you have that guy talking on the phone, you know, because it, it's a good business place. <laughs> so uh, the sacred mountains in the world, you know, I, I really don't want to name them. I mean, we've, we've already divulged a, a, a few of them, but I think it's all right because they're fighting for their existence. And I think there's a, there's a time and a place that sacred places work through the indigenous people to try to help us uh, help them, like try to explain on their behalf. And there's a big a big fight on Mauna Kea right now. Uh, and we see that as part of the water system. You know, all of these places that are volcanic, if something happens to Mauna Kea, it does not just happen to Hawaii. It does not just happen on the big island. It happens around the world because these things are connected. It'll happen for us in California because Mount Shasta and Mauna Kea are related closely related mm -hmm. so if we could get the concept that there are these mountains i mean it's a it's a it's a big jump for people to think that these mountains hold our world together i don't know what people think holds our world together but for us it's these mountains that bring water clear around the world and they bring that stability and they bring the uh air and rains, they bring those things around the world. And they're connected uh, like a web inside where there's um, oceans of fresh water inside that they pump out to the people. They pump out to, and when I say people, I mean all the living things. The water is for the birds and the bats and the deer and the rabbits and the grasses, you know, not just a commodity for people to dry up if they choose to. 
And when when you do that, and I think, oh, like uh, Mono Lake, they dried it up. It's like they can say they dried it up, but in my mind, the water chose to come up somewhere else, mm. and it never came back. You would think if they stopped doing what they were doing, that the lake would fill up again, but it chose to go somewhere else, and that's the that's the concept that I don't think people can really grasp about the 20 sacred mountains is that they are more powerful than us and and maybe and i'm thinking now is like maybe the knowledge that they exist could be something that helps people understand the world a little better how we're all connected like uh we think in time in in uh, terms of how many miles away is that? Like New Zealand is halfway around the world for us, but for Mount Araki um, and Buyumpuyuk, they're not that far. Mm. And they speak. I mean, in the, in our in our uh, doctoring stories about sending the mountain, sending the salmon through the ice waterfalls, and there they would wait for us. Well, we really didn't know that. And I didn't really know that until, you know, <laughs> like 2004, I didn't know. But I had had that story for all my life. It's like the salmon are waiting. And I'm thinking, I wonder where they're waiting because they're not in our river anymore. You know, and, and evidently they're not coming up the Sacramento River anymore because they only do things one time. And all of the salmon that belong on the McLeod would have died before spawning and so when we did that war dance and found out you know they were in new zealand because new zealand told us and then we found uchimek i mean uh, monica i mean uh mataraki Mataraki has ice waterfalls who would know that you know and as we as we go through this piecing together our connections and how close the connections that they actually are uh, because of these mountains you know and i think that if people realized how the mountains are maybe it would help them to see the world not in a capitalistic view or a money-making view but in a whole concept that could bring peace to them you know and as long as we're destroying mountains i don't think people can have very much peace even even me you know when i think about in virginia where they're taking off the mountaintops that hurts my heart it's like i i feel like mount shasta cries about that you know it's like uh when will they stop doing that you know it's like at the bad little kids <laughs> they can do anything if there's money involved they can do it so that vision of the ice waterfall would be an example of people tuning into a, a, a different sort of dimension and understanding and a kind of an invisible connection. How else could they know that? So that's sort of an affirmation of the, you know, the power of the invisible elements of the world, right? And that's a, it's a, yeah, it's a beautiful. Prophecy. Yeah. It's amazing that you would have known it for decades and then gone to New Zealand and seen the ice waterfall and realized wow that story was true <laughs> that wasn't just a story <laughs> it yeah. actually was an event that's so cool and that's there's cool. our salmon in new zealand yeah so what's going to happen with run for salmon this year um run for salmon this year we're still uh looking at what we what we should be doing and trying to decipher the messages here you know maybe we're doing a, a pause so people can catch up and learn more about uh, the prayer journey of Run for Salmon and take a break in that way, but continue to uh, educate our young people and maybe uh, we, will, we will continue the prayer in some way, but not particularly in the way that we have been doing. And maybe this break is to really figure out how the whale comes back in, in connection to the salmon, because this is the struggle right now in the ocean. And we really want to get it right. You know, we really want to do the best that we can for 
our water systems. And you know, though, it, it's interesting because you know, the whale is a mammal like us. And so the representation of what is happening here uh, really reflects on us in my mind, you know, and I'm still praying about these things. I'm still trying to figure out um, the pause that we're in and how do we read that? I mean, what is, what is the message? And I keep getting pieces until finally it's going to, it'll be what it should be, you know, but it's not like, Oh darn COVID's here. We can't do it. You know, it's like, it's like, Oh, COVID's here. What's the lesson? What's the teaching? Because if we don't learn, these things repeat. And if we continue to make the same mistakes, Mother, Mother Nature will continue to correct us. You know, and, and that's the hard part because, uh, I don't know, it's kind of nice not seeing all the traffic <laughs> and all the airplanes flying everywhere. I know a lot of people are, are uh, real depressed about it and that sort of thing, but I'm sort of enjoying the fact that the birds are flying and the deer, you know, the coyotes are walking downtown and <laughs> in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to be in Northern India and have people see the Himalayan mountains that they've never seen in their entire lives, it's just right? such a profound change. Yeah, it's giving people a peek at what Graham's already knew. Like when Graham says, you know, we were, we were um, in Calusa and there was a flock of geese, snow geese, flying over. And I said, oh, wow, there's a whole lot of those. You know, the flock is a big flock flying. And she goes, oh, you never seen a big flock. A big flock would be one that blocks out the sun when it flies by for minutes. Wow. And I'm thinking, wow, that would be a lot of geese. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that would be like seeing the Himalayans. <laughs> it's like people who grew up not seeing it ever. Yeah. And older people who knew from, you know, in the past, how far you could see into the horizons. Yeah. You know, and, and most people don't even recognize um, that their water tastes bad or that the air smells weird. You know, they get used to it. And so when we, you know, when we travel different places, it's like, oh, that, wow, I can't drink that water. <laughs> water, that water makes me sick. You know, it's like, might as well, you know, stick with coffee or tea or something that hides that taste because you can't drink straight water. But other people do. Yeah. It's like, oh, wow, they just get used to it. <laughs> well, I hope that, like you say, the cleaner air and the quietness and the cleaner water and the animals being happier will lead people to, real, you know, see a different vision and realize the way should, things should be. And that yeah. it really, it really affect people's consciousness. I'm gonna. Um, we have about five minutes left. I'm gonna. Colleen and I talked about this earlier. I'm gonna do something I've never <coughs> done. I'm new at this. I'm gonna share my screen and um, bring up a few photographs, and um, Colleen can comment on. Let's see if I can find them. Colleen can sort of talk us through. Uh, hopefully, this will work talk us through some of these images. Yeah, that's my Grams. She was born in uh, 1905 and uh, became a top doctor on the river. She lived on the McLeod River, Winnemum. Spoke Winnemum. Her mom and her mom was a other top doctor, also her dad, uh, Dolly Cantilema. And uh, she's my my uh, teacher she was my mom's teacher so we really miss her this is one of our sacred places on mount shasta um grams was in charge and uh teaching us about the things what we needed to learn um i don't know if anybody knows rick but he's the first dancer standing in line <laughs> and you can see colleen in the purple shirt there listening and an apprentice to the top doctor. 
<laughs> yes. And this is our, we're bringing back the um, eagle dance at Decus. He's, he's, the first little guy is, um, was uh, Jesse. The first little dancer there was Jesse. He's not so little anymore. No. <laughs> neither is Daniel, neither is this. Daniel, guy. yeah. And is that, that Nick, right? that's Nick right behind him there, huh? Yep, that was Nick. <laughs> that's Nick and, and Daniel listening to Grams. <laughs> they were dancing, so she's giving them some extra instructions. Here's Will Perinello, one of our cameramen at the McLeod River Falls, the sacred, the sacred river. Yep, that's part of the, the salmon challenge on the McLeod. This is McLeod River uh, during, uh, I think this is the, no, this is a puberty ceremony. Yeah. On the McLeod River. And the uh, dancers dancing for the young girl that will be coming out as a woman. All of this will be underwater. That dance ground's underwater now when the lake is full. These are the huts. Um, flow me for the young girls that are coming of age. They, they are across the river from us um, and they'll be taken care of on that side until it's time for them to come across for the, the big time. And this is Puberty Rock during uh, one of the ceremonies. Um, the rock was still underwater by three feet when we we started setting up the camp and it started to, I guess they were uh, drawing down water. And so by the time, you know, it starts coming out of the, the water for the first time and uh, it's pretty dirty and we had to wash it and stuff, but it came out just in time uh, for the ceremony because in, the, in, on this rock, uh, the girl makes her first uh, medicine teas that she will then provide to the women in the tribe. And if they raise the dam, this is one of those sacred sites that could be underwater for Yeah, you forever. see the tree, you see the lake line now and the trees, all of those trees will be gone. And it'll go up 20 feet above that line level. And because this is a, uh, a different elevation level, it'll go out wider and deeper than other places. And so this, our puberty rock, we expect to be about 60 feet underwater. Hmm. Again, praying on the McLeod River. And this is at uh, uh, Coonrod, that's Palm. He's uh, dancing. Uh, I might he might be dancing the water dance. Yeah. And there they are getting Kelly, ready. Said, one of the things you said as we looked at these before the this session was that um these photos show the that it's not about you, it's about the tribe, it's about the young people, it's about the community and the yeah. relationship that that everyone has. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to to show show some photos. Yeah, that, yeah, it is. It is about the existence and future existence of these girls, these girls in these hats right here. You might just think it's a, a photo of hats, but you can see their little noses <laughs> poking out of the hats. And so these are actual girls that are a part of the puberty rights ceremony. And it's their knowledge that comes to them to carry on the traditions that we're struggling to keep. You know, we've been struggling ever since um, gold was discovered here, California. And this is Danielle and me, and we're in the Altai. And I don't know if that's before we went up on the horse ride to the lakes. Yep. Or... Before, you're smiling. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't in pain. <laughs> But it was such a it was such an honor to be with him, and this is at one of the the lakes on the mountain, and uh, I had to use a cane because I had hurt my leg trying to get on the horse. 
<laughs> I mean, we're not horse people, you know, California Indians. But um, the beauty of this mountain was so much like uh, Mount Shasta in a lot of ways. You know, and, and I could see uh, the relative connection that my mountain would be there. And we brought back some of the water that Daniil gave us there. And um, it was a beautiful time. Very special and, and spiritual. This is the uh, Sacred Site Guardians. You can see Daniil there, Colleen also. And this is Emmett Aluli, who'll be joining us in three weeks as, as a commentator after the film. This was for the, on Maui, a rain ceremony that we did for, uh, as part of the World Conservation Congress. So this, this is an example of what I was asking Colleen about before, about the value of Sacred Site Guardians getting together to do ceremony and bring their energy together and talk about politics and spirituality and have some days together. But the ceremony was the most important thing. It was a beautiful, beautiful time. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, um, Pua, Pua Case is holding the We Are Mauna Kea sign. Um, she was, she was one of the connections that I found in trying to follow the salmon. And the salmon, when they went to New Zealand by ship, had to stop in Hawaii to get ice from Mauna Kea to, for their journey on to, on to New Zealand. And so, there was a time when Mount Shasta Spring went dry and we were in search of how to help the mountain. And it took us to Hawaii. I'd never been to Hawaii before. And we went to the big island because we had this list of things to do. And I didn't know Pua, I didn't know anybody in Hawaii actually. And uh, another film called The Dancing Salmon Home was playing at the Hawaiian Film Festival in Waimea. And so I contacted them and said, this is what I want to do. And so they hooked me up with um, Pua, because I said, I really need somebody who's traditional, who will introduce me to these mountains and who will take me to the volcano and take me to the water. Since I'm not from Hawaii, I can't just, you know, go there, I have good intent of why I need to do these things. But they put me in touch with, with uh, Pua, and she didn't really know me either, uh, but she, uh, it was like an instant recognition of why this had to take place. I wasn't asking to go to a luau, or, you know, I'm asking her to take me to your sacred water. We need some water. Uh, help me find the whales, because we need to sing to the whales, and they're in migration. So we need to also pray to the turtles, the sea turtles, because they're the oldest and they come on land. And they started um, new things that, that helped other Mother Earth survive. And so she helped us do those things. And so since that time, um, we have been very good friends like sisters. And her daughter, Havani, she has an album out now and uh, is a fabulous singer and dancer. They're so powerful and strong and, and the mountains, I could just feel them come together when we're together. You know, if, I'm, if I go over there, if they come here, you know, I was on the mountain with her the, during the first arrests on the mountain and we, we set down prayers for each of those folks that was there. Uh, so I feel very, very close with her. And our, our sign uh, that has gone all over the world with me is we are not defeated. And on the other side, it says, uh, good things are coming. I believe in the good things coming. And uh, when we do that, you know, we have to believe in the good things that are coming. Even right now, there are good things coming. And we have to recognize that even though we have bad things, you know, th that's like um, people say, everything that your tribe has been through, and you guys still have a lot of humor. It's like, that's how it is now. Even though we're going through a lot, uh, there has to be a lot of good things that are gonna be available to us if we can, if we see it. And that's my grandson, Nechai. 
he's a water warrior and a salmon lover. <laughs> yes. Yes. You think? And that's uh, Karina and Pua. We're at the uh, Shell Mound in Berkeley with Wounded Knee, and we're setting down prayers uh, for that place. And and really, uh, I just I just want to say that if if the Shell Mound could come to life in the way that that Karina is working towards, and all of her folks that are helping that would be a, a push for a whole lot of indigenous view of people. If people could see that in Berkeley, they could see that on the mountain because that's the connection. I mean, right now there's a, there's a uh, parking lot over the top of that spiritual place. But if that could be released and it could be put back into the indigenous people's yeah. hands and Karina, yeah the the native indigenous people there could then again orchestrate what needs to happen to bring about that shell mound in the way that it needs to be now for the people not just her people but all of the people and so i have high hopes that uh, our prayers and uh, our efforts for mauna kea and the shell mound and the mountains uh, it's going to make it make a difference. And Winona, <laughs> Winona Leduc, um, she's been a good friend and a supporter for a long time. And I just I just admire uh, the ability that she has to get things done. You know, uh, I was talking to her just recently about. Um, uh, Medi medical marijuana and she was saying that you know she was trying to get her tribe uh to invest in that but they i guess they didn't but she went ahead and bought a farm in kentucky and went ahead with it because uh there is a a reason for the that medicine and i and i'm looking at that and i think well yeah there's you know hemp is something that could change the world too. It could make bigger changes. If we want our skies to be clear, then let's start getting away from the things that make it black. Mm. Yeah. But she came to uh, Coonrod, this is at Coonrod ceremony, and uh, was there when the uh, fish biologist, and we were talking about bringing this fish back from New Zealand. Mm. And Winona will be a week from today at the same time. Winona is going to be with us to talk about the profit and loss film about Canadian tar sands. Yeah. That. Here, we, here we are on the mountain, kind of getting, getting towards the end here. We can let everybody go soon. Yeah. Some of our memes that we uh, struggle to produce to keep up with social media. And here's our favorite. Yep. Yeah. We hope that they won't all just be dumb and die. <laughs> but I'm not so sure that our fearless leader of the United States is going to be able to accomplish that. Well said. Listen, everybody, <laughs> Colleen, thank you so much for being with us today. It's really been an honor. And um, I think we'll all sign off. But thanks to everybody who's been listening. And please Watch the films and uh, join us next week for Winona LaDuke. Thank you, Colleen. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Future generation. Bye. Bye, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Bye, Toby. Bye. Bye. <laughs>